is, how can Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 be referring to the angels as the sons of God when Hebrews, inspired by the Spirit, states God has called no angel his son? You understand the objection so I can put holes in this? Do you understand what the objection is so we can put holes in narrative? Holes. There are holes in the narrative. Holes in the narrative. Hole. Can, you ready for me to refute this? How can angels be called sons of God when Hebrews 1.5 says God has never called any angel his son? God has never said to an angel, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. This again illustrates the arrogance and the pride of those who think they know scripture. May God remove the beans from my eyes, destroy my pride and arrogance, keep us humble and teachable. This shows why the Bible put in the hands of someone uninitiated, untaught, becomes a dangerous weapon that's misused. Okay? Because these statements are not referring to sonship in general. Hear me out. The statements, the passages that Hebrews is citing, it's not referring to sonship in general. It's referring specifically to Davidic kings. It's referring to what I call to royal sonship. Royal sonship. Now, here, we're going to meet. I've done sessions. Guys, I'm not lying. I've done sessions on these. If you go to my YouTube channel, type in, Arian, A-R-I-A-N, and Hebrews, or just type in Hebrews 1. I've done multiple sessions, and in the description box, I've linked to multiple articles where I explain this sonship of our Lord. Royal sonship. What do I mean by royal sonship? In the Old Testament, God made a covenant with David. Now, I'm going to tell you where you're going to find this covenant. Write down 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Read the entire chapter. 1 Chronicles chapter 17. Read the entire chapter. 1 Chronicles chapter 17. Read the entire chapter. Also read the entirety of Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Okay, let me give you the three chapters to read. 2 Samuel 7. Read the entire chapter. I mean, you can read from 10 to 16, but read the entire chapter. You got to read all of it. 1 Chronicles 17, which is a reiteration of 2 Samuel 7. No, PayPal is not down, Green Feathers. It's working. And then my name is Ibn Malik. Ibn Malik. Thank you, brother. 1 Chronicles 17, the entire chapter, and Psalm 89. So let me sum up what they say. God made a covenant with David. So guys, got to listen because I'm going to show you the context of those statements. God made a covenant with David. And here's the covenant. God swore to David that the kingdom of Israel that belongs to God would be bequeathed to David and his descendants so that God made an everlasting, irrevocable, irrevocable covenant where he swore to David that my earthly kingdom, my throne that is on earth, my throne that is on earth, my throne that will be in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, before it was divided, will be yours and your physical descendants after you. You, David, will reign on my earthly throne, and your heirs will reign on my earthly throne, ruling over my people on earth as my representatives. And he goes, this covenant I will never revoke. It's everlasting. Even if your sons sin and disobey me, I will have them beaten with rods of men, flogged by the sons of men, but I will never revoke the covenant. I will make sure you'll have a man from your line sitting on the throne representing you because my earthly kingdom I give to you forever. That's the promise of God. Do we get it? That's the promise of God. Included in that promise, guys, listen. Included in that promise is God promising to become the father of the king and making the earthly king his son 
in order to then be the guarantor, the guardian of the throne. Meaning, God promised that when the son of David sits on the throne, I will be his father, he'll be my son, and as my son, he'll reflect me, represent me, reflecting my rule in heaven, he'll do it on earth, and as his father, I will be the guarantor, the guardian of the throne, I will protect him, I'll provide for him, and I'll destroy his enemies before him. So this is called royal sonship. When David sat on God's earthly throne and David's heirs sat on God's earthly throne, God then became their father and they became his sons. And as a father, he would protect them, fight for them and preserve them and fight off their enemies if they proved faithful to his covenant. Okay, we got that? Second Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17, Psalm 89. Did we get that? Everyone clear? Because I'm going to give you Psalm 89. I'm going to read snippets of it. But I got to make sure I repeat myself at least three times so you can get it. Everyone got it, right? Okay, because I'm going to show you. Psalm 89, 19 to 27. Psalm 89, 19 to 27. Here is the covenant promise of God. Here it is. Psalm 89, 19 to 27. Okay, here we go. Let's break it down. Then you spoke in a vision, Psalm 89, 1927, to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. So David is a Mashiach. I sent Samuel, my prophet, to anoint him with oil, symbolizing David being anointed by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. To be anointed makes you an anointed one, meaning David, David, is a Mashiach, a Messiah, a Christ. Right? Now watch here. With whom my hand shall be established. I will establish him by my hand, meaning my power. can also represent Christ as God's right hand. Christ Jesus, the eternal Logos, empowering David on behalf of the Father. Also my arm shall strengthen him. Either referring to God's power metaphorically or it can be referring to the Lord Jesus as the right arm of God, right? So you, if God metaphorically has two hands, a right and a left, Jesus is the right, the Holy Spirit is the left. And his arms are uncreated eternal, metaphorically, because God is not a physical being. Okay, now let's continue. My Also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, see? Because I'm with him to empower him and defeat his enemies. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. You see, I will be the guarantor, the guardian of his throne. I will be his father. I will destroy his enemies. I will scatter them and preserve him if he maintains covenant faithfulness. Now let's read the rest of it. I hope you're learning deep theology, deep exegesis, Seeing how miraculously deep and miraculously and beautifully structured the Bible is, historically accurate, and truly a miracle from the Lord, this Bible. And may the Holy Spirit always enable us to rightly interpret it for the glory of Christ, to know our God and love Him and obey Him. Here you go. Psalm 89, 1927. But my faithfulness, here's God's promise, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with Him. And in my name, in my authority, name meaning power, authority, by my power, by my authority, his horn, horn, refers to sovereignty. In the Bible, horn refers to kingship, dominion, sovereignty. By my power, by my authority, his dominion shall be exalted. Also, I will set his hand, obviously metaphorical meaning, I will set his authority over the sea and his right hand over the rivers meaning he will rule the earth and beat the kings and subjugate them. Now watch here. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God. See, when David becomes the king, from that moment on, God becomes his father in this unique, special sense. And David becomes God's son in this unique, special sense. A sense in which not everyone 
shares in, but only David and his heirs to the throne and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now, let's read Psalm 89, 28 to 37, to see that this promise is irrevocable, irrevocable. Same Psalm, 89, 28 to 27. Watch here. Okay, watch. Because you got to set it up. Got to set it up. So explain here. Psalm 89, 28 to 37. My mercy I will keep for him forever. And my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed, his physical seed, also will I make to endure forever. And his throne, notice it's David's throne that God gave to him as the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod. He's going to have men beat them with rods and their iniquity with stripes. I'm going to have sons of men flog them. Is it ironic or a coincidence that Jesus, the son of David, was beaten with the rods of men? and flogged and whipped by men, the very punishment God swore to inflict on the sons of David who break covenant, fell on Jesus, the greater David, the greater Solomon, the heir of David's throne. So Jesus took the punishment of all the rebellious sons of David who were heirs to his throne, who failed to maintain covenant faithfulness and sinned against God. So their punishment fell on Jesus Jesus taking their punishment on himself. He was the one beaten with rods and flogged and striped, whipped. He took their punishment. See what Jesus did? The greater son of David took the beating of his physical ancestors, all the kings who sat on David's throne before him, who were not sinless and perfect and flawless, but broke covenant faithfulness, bringing God's judgment. He, their descendant and heir, being greater than all of them, the greater David, voluntarily in his love, took their punishment in his own body to redeem them. Right? Then I will punish their transgression with the rod and then iniquity with stripes. And I notice God's promise. Nevertheless, even though I discipline them, my loving kindness, I will not utterly take from him. I will not remove my faithfulness from David, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. I will be faithful to him and not break my promise to him. My covenant, I will not break. Notice how clear and emphatic, clear, emphatic, and insistent and repetitive God is in ensuring you get the point. This covenant is unbreakable nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Okay, now watch the rest of it. I'm going to show you what Hebrews 1.5 was quoting. There is no contradiction. Okay, watch here. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie. You see how repetitive, explicit, insistent, and how many different ways God is saying this? I will not lie. I cannot lie. I've sworn by my holiness, by my integrity, by my character. The word that came out of my mouth will not be altered. Hammering it so it can sink in. I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. That's a reference to Jesus, by the way. That there is a faithful witness in heaven who is going to hold the Father accountable to his promise. The faithful witness in the sky, literally, the faithful witness in heaven. David, you have someone in heaven who will be a test of, a <clears throat> witness holding me accountable to remain faithful to my covenant to you and ensuring I don't break covenant and guaranteeing I fulfill the promise to you, this faithful witness in the sky. Is it a coincidence in Revelation 3.14, one of the names of Jesus is the faithful and true witness. And is it a coincidence that Jesus is the faithful witness in the sky 
who became a physical son of David to fulfill God's promises to David to make sure that God kept his word perfectly because he's the faithful witness in the sky. Revelation 3, 14, one of the names of Jesus, the faithful and true witness. And Revelation 3, 7, 8, what does Jesus have? Jesus has the keys to the household of David. Revelation 3, 7 to 8. Jesus has the keys to the Davidic dynasty, to the household of David. He has the keys. He has the keys, the key. He, in Revelation 3, 7, 8, says, has the key to David's house. And in Revelation 3, 14, he's the faithful and true witness. So in, Re in Psalm 89, 37, where God says there's a faithful witness in the sky holding me accountable, not to break covenant, but ensuring I maintain faithfulness and fulfill my promise to you. The New Testament identifies that faithful witness as the eternal word, the Logos, the Son, who then becomes flesh from the virgin to become a son of David, to fulfill the promises of David, guaranteeing that God kept his word perfectly. Let me repeat the passages. Revelation 3, 7, 8, Jesus holds the key to the house of David. It opens doors that no man can shut and shut doors that no man can open. Revelation 3, 14, Jesus is the faithful and true witness. So what did Psalm 89, 37 say? God says, David, there's a faithful witness in the sky, literally in heaven, that's going to hold me accountable, ensuring that my promise to you will never be broken, but I completely and perfectly fulfill it. Here it is. You see how it's pointing to Jesus? And Jesus is the faithful and true witness, Revelation 3, 14. The one who holds the key to the house of David, Revelation 3, 7, 8. The son of David who sits on David's throne, Luke 1, 32 to 33. Therefore, this is the faithful witness who in heaven stands as a guarantor, ensuring that the father's promise will be perfectly fulfilled. And he doesn't break his covenant with David because he himself came down and became flesh from the blessed Holy Virgin by the Spirit to become a physical son of David to fulfill the promises to David perfectly. Catch it? Can't move on if you don't get it. Yeah, I'm going to end it with uh, David. I won't talk about Mama today. Because I'm running out of time. I can't believe it. Guys, you got understood what I just said? Who that faithful witness in the sky and heaven is? The Son of God, the Lord Jesus, the eternal word, the Father's begotten, the eternal companion of the Spirit. He's the faithful witness in heaven who will be the guarantor ensuring the covenant promises to David are perfectly fulfilled. And then he in his love condescends to be born of the Blessed Virgin, to be of the household of David, to sit on David's throne, ruling it forever, Luke 1, 32 to 33. Which is why in Revelation 3, 7 to 8, and Revelation 3, 14, Jesus is said to be the faithful and true witness who holds the key to the house of David. Here's that faithful witness who ensured that God's covenant David was perfectly fulfilled by becoming the heir to David's throne. Realizing the promises to David, and now he has the key to David's dynasty. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Son of David, Son of God, Son of Man, Son of the Virgin. Right? So, what is Hebrews 1.5 talking about? Well, let's look at the context now. Let's, let's line, line them up. Psalm 2, 6-7. Okay. Second, well, here, let me do this. First Chronicles 17, 10 to 13. We'll go to 14. First Chronicles 17, 10 to 14. Okay. First Chronicles 28, 4 to 7. First Chronicles 29, 23. Second Chronicles 9, verse 8. Okay. Second Chronicles 13, verse 8. Second Chronicles 21, 7. So let's read these, all right? Psalm 2, 6 to 7, is, which is what Hebrews 1, 5 was quoting. So let's wrap it up. 
Psalm 2, 6 to 7. Hebrews 1, 5 was quoting Psalm 2, 7. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said, Jehovah said to me, you are my son today, I've begotten you. See what it's referring to? It's referring to the anointed king who reigns in Zion in Jerusalem on earth. When he reigns, God says, you are my son, I've begotten you. Let me ask you a question. Did God ever appoint an angelic creature to rule on earth in Jerusalem as his representative, <clears throat> whereby God then makes him his royal son? Has any angel been given the honor of ruling God's throne on earth in Jerusalem as God's representative, whereby God then makes that angel his royal son. Was this ever given to an angel? Or was this given exclusively to a human family, to a human being, David? That's what Hebrews 1 is saying. Hebrews 1 is not saying angels are not sons of God in any sense of the term. Hebrews 1 is saying angels are not God's sons in the sense that David and the physical heirs of David who sat on David's throne were God's sons. This type of sonship where a human being chosen from the earth, David and his household, to sit on God's throne on the earth because God had a throne on earth, which he gave to David, whereas the throne in heaven he occupied exclusively. That kingship he didn't give to any angelic creature. He gave it only to a human family, the Davidic dynasty. So that's what Hebrews 1 is saying. It's saying God never honored any angelic creature to reign as king on his behalf, on his throne, whereby he then becomes God's royal son. Because this privilege he only gave to David and his heirs, and by extension to Jesus, because when Jesus was born of the virgin, he became a physical descendant of David, to inherit the promises of David. So as a physical son of David, he'd become David's heir sitting on David's throne. That's what it's saying. 